Shakespeare's plays make up a huge proportion of productions put on by Australia's leading theatre companies, usually about one per season per year. Given that there are already so few coveted spots available for other playwrights, what's the value of restaging Shakespeare's work over and over when we could be hearing from other voices? John, you talked before about um, your introduction to Shakespeare and, and what grabbed you. And, and I, I want to ask what it was that took you to England to seek that out and what you didn't see in 60,000 years of story that was already here in Australia. Just to this question of voices that are not heard, the voices that are not heard here, the mm. Iliads and the Odysseys mm. that have been written here over 60,000 years. Did that not speak to you and Shakespeare did? Stan, 60 years ago, when I was uh, 20 and heading off to England, um, the, the voice of the First Peoples was non-existent. Mm. It, it didn't happen, they were invisible. We never heard their stories. We saw a little bit of their art, but mainly on tea towels. Um, it wasn't in any galleries. We were woefully unfamiliar with uh, Indigenous peoples' art, history, culture, even their presence. Um, so, as a young actor, um, there wasn't much of an industry happening here, and everybody of my generation headed off mm. to England. People mm. like Clive James, Jermaine Greer, all that generation, many of them stayed there. Uh, people like Bruce Beresford, myself, uh, came back. But um, that's where you went to work, and uh, the theatre that was available was, of course, English theatre. Mm. And most of the theatre being done in Australia was English theatre or American theatre. There were very, very few Australian plays, um, maybe one every two or th two to five years, an Australian play would hit the stage. Uh, we were fed with um, Broadway and West End hits and the occasional uh, Shakespeare or, or Moliere or Chekhov. That was, that was the diet. Mm. And uh, it's only very recently, we have to remember, that the Indigenous voice has begun to be heard and their presence do you, acknowledged. Do, do you feel that that is a story that you can engage with, is your story, as much as, say, Shakespeare, maybe? I'm sorry, I don't know the... An, an Indigenous story here, would you feel that that is a story that... Belo that is a tradition that belongs to you as well, as well as Shakespeare? I think uh, we are being invited to share um, Indigenous culture now and to come on board and enjoy it and invite uh, Indigenous writers to contribute to the, the repertoire, which is happening more and more, of course, not only on stage but in television and film. Um, it's a, a phenomenon it's over the last maybe 10 years that has begun to be so significant. Mm, okay. I would disagree, respectfully. I think that, you know, what's the saying? Is it Toni Morrison who says white innocence is white supremacy? Aboriginal people were here. We've been telling our story for over 60,000 years. And in fact, theatre was such a part of the civil rights movement within Australia, the National Black Theatre. It was used as a means to have dissidents when, um, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s. Um, I think if you were to go to say, hey, look, we didn't know back then, we weren't aware of Aboriginal culture and we're just coming on board now, which I, I disagree with. I think Aboriginal people, people of colour, marginalised people have, have had to fight incredibly hard to be heard and to be seen. It's not a phenomena at all. Um, and, and the things that I say in my plays are just continuations of what uh, knowledge I've been handed down generationally. But if let's, like, let's say we, what we were to go with what you're saying is we all went overseas, we didn't know. Shouldn't we then be saying, OK, maybe the, the trying to see if Shakespeare is relevant and mm. trying to say these themes are universal as opposed to going, hey, no, we're just very empathetic and we're able to see ourselves and have a work. Maybe then do we go, let's start investing in the voices of Australia. Why not start investing in more First Nations voices, in young people, in, 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 playwright, in playwrights that are emerging? How do you feel about that question, Akira, that who gets to write that story? Because, you know, I speak to a lot of um, white Australian writers who say, well, that's not really my story to tell, or they're reluctant to enter that story, or feel as if it may be fraught or, or appropriating someone else's story. Is that a tradition that belongs equally to John as Shakespeare does to you and I as well? Do you mean in terms of engaging terms with of Aboriginal engaging content? engaging with or, or writing it, um, performing it? Well, I think when it comes to First Nations voices, we should be being able to tell our own stories because historically we haven't been able to. There's so much power in being able to tell your story and have a voice. And taking away people's voice is something that Australia has historically done to to oppress Aboriginal people and is still, one could argue, a form of colonialism that is happening today. I don't 
quite necessarily understand the question. But what I do think is that everybody has the capacity to hear. Mm. You know, going back to our Shakespeare's themes universal, I would say actually no. Shakespeare isn't necessarily universal, it's that empathy is timeless. Mm. and we're willing to listen to each other. So I think the question is, like, a anyone can, can be willing to listen. Are people who would traditionally hold Shakespeare in reverence, are they willing to listen to and, and give merit to cultures and voices that don't necessarily speak to their background or their culture or their history or upbringing? Um, I, I, I think we are really trying very hard now to, to enter that conversation and to hear those voices and to encourage um, Indigenous writing. I think this is very much part of the theatre industry's responsibility and I think it is answering that call. Yeah, to an extent, but over the last two years, there's been major cuts to the theatre industry. You know, people say that theatre is dying, and I wonder if actually theatre isn't dying, we're just not involving, because we hold things like Shakespeare as such a, to such reverence that it's become a tenet of our culture. Whereas it's not a tenet, of our, a tenet of our culture, it's just, it's a really good part of it. But let's explore and give power to others. Yes, but... Um, but uh, Sorry, sorry. It, it, I don't think that there's an excess of Shakespeare being done in our, in our state theatre companies. Uh, the Sydney Theatre Company might do one every couple of years, but it's not like a, it's taking up, uh, sucking up all the air or taking up all the spaces uh, in anywhere around the country. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually uh, much more... It's, it's fair to say, Tunaki, your, your work is being performed, which is a good thing. Yes, but we need more. There's been major cuts across especially youth <clears> sector, <throat> mid-sector, new work. And, you know, there is a whole theatre company devoted to, to Shakespeare, Bell Shakespeare. They're getting, you know, a whole new studio built, whereas... There's also you know, a lot Angara, of companies are, that, for instance. Um... I think it's one. I think it's about, like, who, whose voices are we hearing? And, and at the moment, there's been such cuts to art funding. Lots of arguments for, like, to, for Shakespeare to, you know, like, have young people embrace it. But there's been massive cuts, especially to youth theatre. And, and Bree, that goes to what a lot of you've, you've talked about, and that is an elitism or a capture of Shakespeare as part of elitism or power, the capture of knowledge by a few. Shakespeare didn't start out as an elitist. Um, his father was essentially a, a, a bureaucrat, a, 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 a public servant. Um, he performed plays for masses. How has it been captured by an elite? Why is it now seen as being elitist? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it is interesting to reflect on how when his works were being written and shown in that immediate context, that was very much pop uh, a form of entertainment for the masses. Whereas now it's pretty much undeniable that the way Shakespeare is often put on is sort of the audience demographic is closer to those who would enjoy opera than it is to those who go to films and enjoy actual mass forms of entertainment. And I would like to take this question and just sort of reshape it slightly and punt it over to John, if I may, which is that um, I know you've worked previously with the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization. And for those who don't know, that's an organisation who give an extraordinary amount of money to a very small number of people, and it's people who really, really like Western civilization, And the organisation is run by people who set a tone that not only is Western civilization really great, but in many ways it is the best. And I would actually like to hear from you, who is a man who has spent the better part of his life thinking deeply and in nuanced ways about William Shakespeare. How does it make you feel to work with people and to know that there are people who exist who use Shakespeare as the poster boy for the supremacy of Western <laughs> civilization? Can I just say, before I hear from John, Ramsey, of course, is a group that was involved in funding a course in Western civilization, yep. among other things, that attracted a bit of criticism. Mm. Bree, I, I don't actually work for the Ramsey organization. I did give one uh, question and answer conversation at an event once for them. That's my connection with the Ramsey Centre. Um, I think um, that students and uh, all of us should be involved with as bro broad a spectrum of culture as we can. Um, I'd say going back in, uh, to the turn of the century, uh, English culture particularly uh, dominated our, our cultural landscape, uh, that followed by European culture. But since then, we've had, you know, um, much more uh, investment with um, uh, uh, cultures from the rest of Europe and Asia. And uh, all this is feeds into our national culture now. All these different um, streams are now feeding into who we say we are as Australians. Um, I 
don't think that we should be holding up any particular culture as being the dominant or the superior one. Uh, they all have marvellous things to offer. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, the, the arts of, of, uh, of, of Southeast Asia particularly, who are our close neighbours. But Shakespeare is used as the poster boy, right, for Western civilization being the best? Uh, no, I don't agree with that. I'd say my, my, Michelangelo or Beethoven or, uh, you know, Van Gogh. I mean, you, you can take your pick about poster boys for Western civilization. They're all white. Mm. <laughs> well, we, 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 so hold, universal. Hold that, hold that. <laughs>